Now, my brothers and sisters, to be a son and daughter of God is to arrive at that place to really see, have you really received Christ? Do you really believe in Jesus? Can I show you a sign of believing in Jesus? Go to John 14. You see, in John 14, the Bible lets us know if we have really received Christ. We saw in the verse that receiving Jesus, this is how you and I can be born again and receive the adoption and become children of God, right? It is in John 14, this is a test. And this is why Christians, we don't judge each other. We shouldn't judge each other. We, should, we shouldn't judge each other in the context of trying to determine one's fate. I, I don't have that discernment, you don't. The man who's wicked today can be the righteous man tomorrow. If, you would have, if, if the last thing we saw Peter do was stand before Jesus rebuking him and correcting him, and Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. If that was the last thing we saw, we would say, yup, looks like Peter's done. But the same Peter who allowed himself to go under momentary control of Satan is the same Peter that led out the early church under the early reign. And so you cannot determine people's fate by what you see now. There are a lot of people right now that are practicing bona fide wickedness. And they're members of the church. They are elders. They are pastors. They are presidents in conferences. They are all over the map. They're not just in the pews only. They're everywhere. We're all under attack. And our only safety is Jesus, not our position. And so it is that God says, listen, you, 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 wanna, you, you and I, we all have to make sure that while we do not judge, meaning determine the fate of an individual in what they're doing now and then trying to determine their end result fate, we can't do that. That's a discernment that belongs to God and God alone. Amen. But we are fruit inspectors. Isn't that right? We are, didn't Jesus say, by their fruit, you shall know them. I'm a fruit inspector. You're a fruit inspector. And when I see certain fruit, I get, family, when I walk up to a tree and I'm like, I, I, you know, I smell it, I look at it, you know, I might even taste it. I can say, oh, apple, right? You know, the berry, you know, same thing, raspberry. The fruit that grows off of the vine or the tree, it helps us know what it is. It doesn't mean it will always be that. This is the difference between the natural world and the spiritual. A person can bear the fruit of wickedness now, but when they're born again, they can become children of the Most High God. Amen. Oh, man, that's good news. Thank God. Once upon a time, if y'all would have seen me, you'd have said, that boy is destined for hell. <laughs> when my lovely bride invest in, you know, interviewed my mother, she was wise. Ladies, single ladies, if you're married, too late. But single ladies... If you want to get a good indicator of the man you're considering to marry, go check out his relationship with his mother. Amen. That's a good indicator. My wife checked out the, you know, my relationship with my mom. And as I told you, what was my mother to me? She was like my best friend. My wife saw that. and She was like, oh, I got a good one. <laughs> but here's the deal. Sometimes if we're not careful, you know, the way we treat our parents and the way we treat each other, brothers and sisters, that's fruit that we're showing people. And they might make a decision to say, well, right now, this is not going to work. Jesus says there's fruit to those who profess to follow me and believe in me. Well, what's the fruit? John 14. Look at John 14 and verse 12. What's the fruit? If we really believe in Jesus, the Bible says in John 14, right there in verse 12, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. How are we doing with that? When we look at the life of Jesus and we watch how he dealt with sinners and saints, when we look at the self-sacrificing life of Christ and we watch that his lifestyle, not a moment, family, I, I, I don't know. I really don't know much about this church anymore, except for the fact that you're a very big congregation. Every leader that you've had here thus far comes with wonderful reputation, and I'm very grateful to be associated with you. This is what I know of you. 
but I don't know anything else after that. So what I'm saying, if, if, you know, I'm just saying it because sometimes people do this stuff, but I, I'm a pastor of a church now, and I dare not say this is the year of evangelism because the question then remains, then what were you doing last year? And what are you going to do next year? There's no such thing as a year of evangelism. Every day is a day of evangelism. Evangelism is not an event. It's who we are. It's part of who we are and what we do all the time. Follow what I'm saying? Jesus went about doing good. And he was healing all that were oppressed of the devil, etc. These are the works of Christ. When you study the works of Christ, how did Jesus deal with little children? How did Jesus deal with those little children? You know, look at the impact Christ had on children. The impact Jesus had on children is that children, when they would get around Christ, they, they, they knew, oh boy, oh boy, here goes my best friend. They had this attitude that they were drawn to Christ, not repulsed from Christ. One of the things I often test myself is my interaction with children and sometimes even with animals. Seriously, I've learned if you really have a friendly spirit, even dogs, many of them will pick that thing up. Their, their, their tails all, you know, their tails up. They'll be like, rrr, rrr, you know, they, they see all the other people, rrr, 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 everything. And then the dog looks at you and they're like, rrr. you know what I'm saying? That, that dog said, there's something different about this person. <laughs> No, but if you read that book, Desire of Ages, when it talks about Jesus as a child, it says that even when he went throughout the groves in the neighborhood, it says even the creatures were touched by his presence. Can you imagine that we could be filled so much with the spirit of God that the creatures of the grove can know a man and a woman of God, yea, a son and daughter of God is in our midst. Brothers and sisters, if we really believe in Jesus, the works he did are the works that you and I will do. Hey, here's the best news in the world. You search your heart, you realize, Lord, I'm not doing your works, right? Sometimes we see that. Sometimes we see that if we're brutally honest with ourselves. Do you know God has not called you to see that to despair? God has called us to see that so that we can go to him and redeem the time. To say, okay, Lord, I can't rewind time, but I can redeem time. From this day forward, I will be the son and daughter of God that you've called me to be. And God can help us do that. This is the beautiful thing about serving our Lord and Savior. I was on a call yesterday, a Zoom call, and as I'm doing this meeting at a corporate office with a whole bunch of Muslims, Christians of different denominations, and the rest. And as I'm on there and I'm giving my testimony and I'm throwing some points in there and everything, and you know, one of the things I wanted the people to see is I said, you know, I told them, I said, I used to be Muslim. I said, yeah, yeah, I used to be Muslim and everything. And, and, and the Muslim brother asked questions at the end of the meeting. It was wonderful. But when I, was, when I was doing that meeting and I was talking about how I used to be Muslim, et cetera, et cetera, I got to this point where I said, can I tell you what attracted me most to Christianity versus Judaism, Hebrew Israelitism or, or Islam, et cetera? I said, in Judaism and Islam, if we're dealing with the major world religions, right? I said, in Judaism and Islam, what you often find is the sinner going through various efforts to appease and follow the God of whomever they acknowledge. The sinner is chasing after God. I said, can I tell you what I love about Christianity? It's the story of a holy God chasing after the sinner. Making all this incredible sacrificial effort just to get the sinner to see, I'm worthy of your worship. Brothers and sisters, God is not here to destroy us. God is not here to condemn us. God loves us and he wants us to be saved and not lost. And he is determined if you and I are lost, I guarantee you we earned that one. If we're lost, oh, we earned it. We worked hard for that one because it's hard to resist the love of God. Jesus says, if you really believe on me, the works that I do, you'll do them also. So let's go to our, down to some of our final points here. What, you know, here's the question. What does being a son or daughter of God, what does it look like? Lord, what does it look like? We live in a wicked world. We live in a world where there's lots more children of Satan than there are sons and daughters of God. That's the world we live in, family. 
And so we need to ask this question, Lord, what does it look like? Because this is what I want to look like. This is what I want to be. So the first thing Jesus says is, if God were your father, you would love me. Let's pause right there. I'm not asking you, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I'm not asking you, do, do you go to church weekly? I'm asking you a very serious question that I really want you to think about. Do you love him? I mean, I really want you to think about it. Do you really love him? Because some people use Jesus as a crutch. I do a lot of my will. I do a lot of what I want. And then sometimes I go to Christ for this, that, and the third. But do you really love him? Is he the passion of your heart? Is he the language of your words? When you go throughout the house, are you always measuring yourself with him, the one whom you adore, the one whom you long to be like and to reflect? Do you really love him? Amen. Jesus says, if he were your father, he says, if God were your father, you would love me. And you know one of the proofs of that love, one of the proofs of that love, chief proofs, if you will, is if you do love me, keep my commandments. You will have no other gods before you. You will not make unto yourself graven images and bow down to them. Now go to 1 Samuel 15. I'm bringing out some final points here. Go to 1 Samuel 15. I need to show you this. I'm going to give you one example that I want you to do times 10. One example times 10. We're being tested, family. We're looking at ourselves and saying, am I really a son of God? Am I really a daughter of the Most High God? I want you to go to 1 Samuel 15. Jesus makes it very clear. If God is our father, then we would love Jesus. And if we love him, we would keep his commandments. When we think about his commandments, we're thinking about having no other gods, not bowing down to idols, etc. Of course, not taking God's name in vain, remembering the true Sabbath day that we might keep it holy. That Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, not Sunday. That's not in the text. If we really love him, we would do these things. But I want to do one example that I want you to multiply times 10. 1 Samuel 15. In 1 Samuel 15, Samuel says something. He's responding to Saul after he disobeyed God and tried to make it look like he was obeying God. And Samuel said this in 1 Samuel 15, right there in verse 23. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15 in verse 23, it says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and what else? Idolatry. The second commandment forbids the setting up of idols and bowing down and worshiping them, paying homage to them, submitting and surrendering to them. But what did we just see was likened to idolatry in 1 Samuel 15, 23? Stubbornness. You know, if you love Jesus, you wouldn't be stubborn. Is that right? If we really love Jesus, would we be stubborn? No, we shouldn't be, right? If we love him and if we identified stubbornness in our lives because of our love for him, what would we be pleading for him to do? Lord, be that lamb of God and take away my stubbornness. We'd be pleading with God, Lord, take away this idol from my heart. I listen to myself. I bow down to myself. If it doesn't fit what I want, and how I'm going to do things, then I'm not doing it. That is idolatry. Now, what did I just do? What I did was I took the commandment of God and I magnified it and helped us to see it bigger and broader for what it is. Do that times 10. You follow that? Take each of the commandments of God. If I really love Jesus, let me look through the magnifying glass of God's word. Let me magnify each of those commandments and see, Lord, is this what I'm doing to you? And if I am, lead me in the way everlasting. The Bible tests us. If we're really sons and daughters of God, we would love him. And if we love him, we would keep his commandments and not break them. Let's bring out these final points. Let's go back to the slides here. The next test is found in these verses here in 2 Corinthians 6. Another fruit. If we are the sons and daughters of God. It says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, watch this, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my what? Sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The fruit of being a son and daughter is not to find out how much we can mingle with the wickedness in our world, how much we can be a part of the evils that are taking place in our world. There's plenty of evil for all of us to participate in. There's plenty of venues that we can go visit and not give a distincting characteristic while we're there. We just blend in with everybody else who is reveling in their crucifying afresh your father and my father. Breaking the heart of God. God says, I don't want that. If you're really my son, if you're really my daughter, you will not join with those who are for the enemy rather than for me. This can be applied to business. Certainly this can be applied to relationships. God is making it very, very clear, beloved. If we are his sons and daughters, we separate from the evil things that are taking place in this world. And if people have made a covenant, and family, I know that this is hard. This might mean family members. There are some family members that are negative energy some family members that are flat out toxic. Every time we get around them, they are instrumental in the hands of their father to pull you and I away from our father. And we gotta know how to love family members, but still keep that line in place. Thus far, no further. Let me go ahead and give you a summary on that. In fact, look at this, look at this. This quote was very startling to me. Nothing, listen to this carefully, I especially think this for our young people. Nothing can more effectually prevent or banish serious impressions and good desires than association with vain, careless, and corrupt-minded persons. Whatever, listen carefully to this quote, whatever attractions such persons may possess by their wit, sarcasm, and fun, the fact that they treat religion with levity and indifference is sufficient reason why they should not be associated with. It says the more engaging they are in other respects, the more should their influence be dreaded as companions because they throw around in irreligious life so many dangerous attractions. God wants us to understand this is not the surroundings that you want. When you and I are his sons and daughters, we are not going to mingle and hang out with people that are fun, sarcastic, witty, but irreligious. Are you following? Well, we're not done yet. Watch this next one. Worldly associations attract and dazzle the senses so that piety, the fear of God, Faithfulness and loyalty have not power to keep men steadfast. The humble, unassuming, if we keep hanging around these worldly companions, look at the fruit. It says the humble, unassuming life of Christ seems altogether unattractive. To many who claim to be sons and daughters of God, Jesus, the majesty of heaven, is as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. This comes from a precious little book called Adventist Home. I would encourage you, beloved, pick up these books. God knew that one of the things Laodicea was going to suffer with is blindness. And when you are going blind, you need more tools to help you see straight. God has already given us the magnifying glass of his word, but some of us need spiritual bifocals. That's why he gave us those inspired writings of Ellen White, so that it can help magnify what the Bible was already saying. And so that we can look at it and say, brothers and sisters, don't hate on these books. And just because you read a quote where she said, if the people of God were studying his word as they should, there would not have been a need for the testimonies. That is a statement that would have been the case 
But because we were not studying the word as we should, God sent the gift and therefore cherish the gift. Don't hate the gift. Embrace the gift because it's a gift. And when a gift comes from God, I would recommend, please do not reject it. So what is our summary on this? Our summary right here. Let me make sure. Sons and daughters of God are people that love Jesus supremely, keeps his commandments and abstains from unions of any kind that will draw them away from their heavenly father and his teachings. This is the test for sons and daughters of God. This is the sons and daughters of God we should be. Amen. 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 Let's close it out. You know, the Bible speaks a lot about God dwelling in us. God dwelling in us. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell. It says among, but the Hebrew means in. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And then whosoever abides in him does not sin. And that's why Jesus says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That term in you speaks to intimacy. True sons and daughters of God spend time with their father. True sons and daughters of God spend time with their father. Look at this closing quote here. This closing quote here. The youth who finds joy and happiness in reading the word of God and in the hour of prayer is constantly refreshed by drafts from the fountain of life. He will attain a height of moral excellence and a breadth of thought of which others cannot conceive. Communion with God encourages good thoughts noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth, and lofty purposes of action. Those who thus connect their souls with God are acknowledged by him as his sons and daughters. The final lesson, sons and daughters of God are people that spend intimate time with God in prayer and the study of his word. This, this is the God that you and I have the privilege of serving. This is the God that you and I have the privilege of being not merely servants, but being sons and being daughters. This is the God who comes to us and he says, my desire is to be your heavenly father. And just to know, after all these years, he's still reaching out to us. After all these years, rebellion, turning away, doing our own thing. And here it is that his arms are still outstretched. His desire is to still receive each and every one of you. His desire is to let you know that I love you with an everlasting love. And his love draws us. With loving kindness, he draws us. This is why John would say, John would say it so beautifully. In 1 John 3 and verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called, the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Brothers and sisters, we might not have been sons and daughters of God. We might have been wayward children. We might have been rebellious. We might have turned our hearts from him and his wonderful words of life. But do you know it's not too late? You see, God has a ministry of adoption. And last I checked, the adoption agency is still open. He's still willing to adopt us. He's still willing to bring us in. We realize, Lord, I have not been a son. I have not been a daughter. I have not been faithful. I've been thoroughly unfaithful. I cannot calculate my faithfulness, but I can thoroughly calculate my unfaithfulness. God said, that's all right. At least you can see it. And if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He'll forgive us. He'll cleanse us. He will bring us back to his precious arms. And so it is, my brothers and my sisters. On this wonderful weekend where again we're focusing on family focusing because I guarantee you the more I can learn how to be a faithful son of God the easier I can be a son a faithful son to my dad that's the principle the more we can be faithful daughters is the more you can be faithful to your earthly parents if they're still alive the more that we draw closer to Christ, the easier it is to bring holiness and love and happiness in our actual homes. But first things first, we need to get it right with God. 
And so if there's anybody in this room under the sound of my voice, whether you're sitting down here or sitting up there, and you're saying to yourself, I know that after searching the scriptures, after going through the test, I can clearly see that I was not a son of God. I was not a daughter of God. I'm still doing my own thing, mingling my own ways, and I have not been faithful. But I want to respond to God's adoption appeal. This is not an appeal for everybody. I'm talking to the ones who realize I have not been a faithful son. I have not been a faithful daughter. I can see it. But by God's grace, I'm responding to the adoption appeal. And I want him to come into my heart and help me to truly be born again. But that means you surrender all this time. There is no more your will. It is God's will and God alone's. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice, again, whether it be down here in the pews or up top there, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. If you are the one that God is talking to, that God is saying, you have not been a son. You have not been that daughter to me. But I want you now to respond to this adoption. And I want you to surrender your heart. That's right. Don't you worry about who's looking at you. This is your decision. There's nobody in this room that has a heaven or a hell to put you in. This is your decision between you and God and God alone. And I believe that as you stand, Christ stands with you. You are not alone. And you are not illegitimate. And your standing proves that the gospel still works today. And brothers and sisters, I stand with you. I solicit your prayers that I might be a faithful son till I breathe my last breath should I not be privileged to be part of that translated group. I'm going to be praying for you that you be faithful, faithful sons, faithful daughters to a very faithful father. I'd like to invite the rest of you to stand that we might pray for you as well. If you have been walking with the Lord and you have chosen to let God be your father, I want to pray for you that God will sustain you in the decisions that you have already made. But I thank God for that great grand majority of us that have responded to the call. Brothers and sisters, please fight the good fight of faith. The devil's gonna make this hard for us. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us.